replacement in an outpatient setting. So everyone's gearing up for this. Uh, it's growing. It's been going on a few years, but it's really starting to, to take off at this point. Now, our experience here at the Andrews Institute, to explain a little bit more about what we are, we're a freestanding ASC. Uh, we have eight ORs, and we don't have any options for keeping people overnight. It's, it's pure uh, outpatient, so we have to be able to discharge them. So uh, we're going to talk about how we go about that. We did our first total knee in 2015. Uh, since then, we've actually done a couple more, so we've done 178 total knees since de December of 2015. We've done uni knees and total shoulders since about 2010, and then we've been doing uh, total hips for the last uh, couple of years, so we're doing about everything. We've done total ankles also. So that's what we're doing in, a, in an outpatient setting. Um, and so back to total knees, what are our keys in doing outpatient total knees? So I'm gonna walk you through our process, our program, some of the very important keys are number one is patient selection. Patient selection is, is absolutely critical. Uh, our multimodal anesthesia analgesia approach to managing these patients uh, is important as far as their anesthesia and, and pain management uh, expectations go. And then as Dr. Uh, Berger said, setting expectations for the, these people are very, very important because this as you guys have all seen, is a major, major surgery, and it's, uh, and it's very, very common. So for our selection criteria, we have a, a, a very specific set of criteria of age less than 70, an ASA of one or two. Uh, that would obviously be well-controlled comorbidities. Uh, hemoglobin A1C of less than seven, a BMI of less than 40. The patient has to be physically fit, absence, have no clotting disorders, obviously, and have an acceptable home environment. They also need a very strong support system, and they themselves have to be uh, motivated and have a desire to do this. It's really funny, um, a major surgery like this, so many patients are so motivated, especially in the year 2020 with COVID, to not be in a hospital setting. And so that, that may be something else that's actually pushing this, this year, especially, and more, more people uh, being interested in outpatient total joints. Um, and while we, we actually have uh, quite a crowd tonight, I understand we had over 600 registrants for this, this meeting. So obviously there's a lot of interest. Uh, obviously, again, uh, no pain management issues and no substance abuse issues to be able to do this on an outpatient setting. And it's gotta be just a straightforward uh, total joint, nothing uh, fancy, no revisions or anything like that. All our, all our total joints patients meet with our, our total joint navigator and anesthesia for a face-to-face -face appointment. Our total joint navigator is critical. We have a nurse, a master's degree nurse that um, is specifically hired to navigate these patients through our system. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, what she does. As far as our protocols go, the patient has to be scheduled at least three weeks prior to the day of surgery. Uh, they have to be seen by their uh, PCP for pre-op uh, testing labs and clearance within 30 days of the surgery. And they have to come to the ASC to meet with our total joint navigator and our anesthesiologist within, within 10 days of surgery. They must have their lab results and bring them with them or we have to have them accumulated by the total joint navigator for the anesthesiologist to review uh, on that uh, day when they come in. Our required labs that we go with, uh, if they're smokers, we want a chest X-ray. Uh, we're gonna get an EKG. We're gonna check a CBC and a platelet because we're doing regional anesthesia. We're gonna check the INR and then a metabolic profile. All this lab work needs to be within 30 days uh, prior to the surgery. Now, when our patient comes in to meet with our, our joint navigator, uh, our nurse, here's the things she's going to do with, uh, with our patient. She's going to get an accurate height and weight and get a specific BMI. So we know our BMI is, is correct and, and, and under our limits. Our navigator is going to do our pain pump teaching 
and a hands-on demonstration of our catheter and our pump. She's going to show them the catheter we're going to put in. She's going to show them our pump and, and explain exactly how it works. And then when the anesthesiologist meets with the patient, we'll go over that again briefly uh, so the patient has a good understanding. Patient education, uh, and for our continuous catheters, we do quite a bit of those here for lots of different surgeries is critical, but then the total joints is just critical. They have so many things to know about PT and pain pumps and medicines and recovery that patient education is a critical factor and a major, major uh, point that we stress here. Uh, they're going to get crutch and walker training, um, crutch or walker training the day they're here with our total joint navigator. They're going to get reminders and teaching. She's going to go over everything in every detail. Uh, specific surgeon discharge instructions will be gone over uh, by her and explain all the different uh, things the patient should be aware of. And what's nice, they actually come in for their face-to-face, -face, but they also get a walkthrough through our ASC. They get to see what we're doing, see where the pre-op area, where the vacuum is. They get a little more uh, comfortable with our setting, and we feel like that helps them. The, them and their caregiver get to come through and see our situation and, and answer lots of questions uh, that they may have just so that they're more comfortable when they come back for their surgery. And then, of course, the anesthesiologist will sit down with them, be face-to-face, -face, go over um, the anesthetics, uh, the, 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 the femoral catheter, the femoral triangle catheter we'll be putting in, and the IPAC block that we're going to talk about, and make sure the patient's comfortable with all that before they come back for surgery. Now, arthroplasty ERAS, uh, there's a, a nice study done by a hospital for special surgery in New York, and they looked at nine components with over one and a half million patients. And they, their conclusion was the more components that your system did in, this, in these nine ERAS components, the better outcomes they had. And when I looked at this, when I found this article and I looked at this, I said, hmm, you know, we're doing every single one of these things. So we're, we have a regional anesthetic, we're doing spinal anesthetics, we have multimodal analgesia, the patients are getting TXA, uh, all our total joints get two grams of transoxemic acid. Uh, we give them an antimedic, we give them uh, Zofran and Decadron the day of surgery. They get dexamethasone. We have uh, physical therapists see our patients after discharge from recovery room. Uh, they, we have a physical therapist that goes over their, their therapy needs for the first couple of days and what it's like going home and transferring to and from the car. And uh, that, that is something that we've just started recently, been a major factor uh, in, in helping um, our patients. As a matter of fact, Dr. Thomas and I, we, uh, our day has been about total joints. We started with a six o'clock meeting this morning with our total joint team. And uh, all, all of our surgeons were either there or on the phone and our total joint navigator. And we meet uh, quarterly and discuss any issues. So that's another important factor that, that goes along with our program. Uh, we obviously don't put any Foley catheters in. We don't do it intra-op. We did certainly not going, not going to send them home with, with one. Uh, you could, but we don't want to do that, obviously. We're not going to do, we really minimize our narcotics uh, with our multimodal program. So we're not going to do PCAs and we're not going to have drains uh, in our patients for our total joints going home. So let's get into our multimodal management uh, for our total knees. And what do we do preoperatively? So they come in pre-op into your pre-op area, they get their gown on, they get changed, they get the IV started, and we're gonna give them a Valium, a 10 milligram Valium. Uh, we really like the muscle relaxation effect of the Valium and the sedation. Uh, help get these patients relaxed, but also, again, we like it as a muscle relaxer. Uh, we're going to start with our multimodal approach and give them PO gabapentin and a gram of acetaminophen. And then we're going to give them a little more sedation if they need it um, with uh, some IV midazolam. And we'll do our IPAC block. And then we're going to do our femoral triangle catheter. And of course, they're both going to be ultrasound guided. And that's preoperatively. Once we get into the, into the OR, we're going to do a spinal anesthetic. We'll give them their TXA. They get Decadron, eight milligrams. And then we get back into multimodal effect with Toralac, 30 milligrams, K2, 
ketamine, 15 milligrams. Sometimes we'll cut the Cadorlac down to 15 milligrams. And then we give Robax and one gram IV. A lot of time, most of the time, since I'm doing a spinal anesthetic, I'll save that and give that in the PACU. And uh, these total knee patients have a lot of posterior pain. They have a lot of hamstring spasms. And we found that the Robaxin has been, been extremely helpful. Uh, and by giving this uh, IV in, in, the, in the PACU or intraoperatively. We also put on SCDs uh, for um, DVT prevention also. Now, postoperatively, when a patient goes home, we continue that Robaxin for two to three days. 750 QID for, for two to three days to help with that first couple to three days of, of hamstring spasms that they'll get with a total knee. We stick with our um, gabapentin or pregabalin for a couple of weeks. And we keep them on a non-steroidal for about 30 days. If they're on an, a non-steroidal that they're taking at home, we'll have them continue that. If they're not on one, we'll put them on some celecops, celecoxib daily uh, for up to 30 days. Then we have our femoral triangle tech catheter, and that's going to be in for four days. And they'll have a pump. We're going to talk a little bit about, more about that. Uh, and they, di they discontinue their catheter and throw the catheter away and uh, send their pump back in or throw the pump away. The last thing they're going to have that we're going to recommend their use is, is hydrocodone or oxycodone that their surgeon has written for them. We're going to try to minimize our narcotics, use a multimodal approach, and uh, we've had some really good success with this approach. Now, our surgeons, a couple of things that come into play with them. Uh, when we first started, the first surgeon that uh, did the first total knee here back in 2015, he had uh, read some literature that patients did better and had less pain if they did not use a tourniquet. So he, he, we, he did his with, uh, without a tourniquet. And uh, most of our surgeons still use a tourniquet, but that's another factor. If your surgeons don't, uh, that could dec decrease your, your pain risk. The other thing we've been using uh, in our uh, uh, program this year, our surgeons are using the Smith & Nephew robot. We started with a Navio robot, and uh, now they're using what's called the Cori robot, it's, uh, which stands for Center of Real Intelligence. And what this does is this takes a, a 3D model of the joint anatomy that's created from their pre-op CT scan. And this allows the surgeons to get their cuts on the tibia and the femur to very, very, very precise cuts to within one to two millimeters of what they're desired. It's, it's a really little different. I think you guys are all used to seeing a surgeon get their blade and, and cut through the bone. And they, they, those are, you know, they try to get those as precise as possible. But with the, with the uh, robot system, and there are different companies that make different ones. We just have uh, gone with the Smith & Nephew uh, product. What they do is instead of cutting with a, with a knife and taking a blade and cutting through, they actually use a burr. And this burr just kind of shaves down the femur. And they're looking on the computer screen and it shows you the, 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 the condyle here. And it, the different colors, as they get deeper with their cuts, the colors change. And so they can precisely get them to within a millimeter of whether, where they want to be. So here's another image of, uh, of the, the computer image and you see white, green, purple, and uh, that's different depths of cut and they'll end up shaving in this area with their burr and shave down to where this is all the same color, the exact uh, depth of shaving that they want to do so that they get li their alignment uh, better and uh, better fit for their prosthesis. So let's talk about the femoral triangle catheter, and uh, I'll talk a little bit. It's 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 basically an adductor can a canal catheter that we come up a little more proximally, and it's uh, it's it's very simple. It's we're doing the same thing. We're doing it proximally, uh, and then we come in a little bit of an oblique um, oblique uh, approach. And uh, before we get into that, we'll talk about the evolution uh, in my practice in the last thirty years the evolution of uh, pain management for total knees. And uh, when I was a resident, pretty much we were doing uh, just narcotics. 
And uh, then uh, when I finished my residency, we started an acute pain service. I trained at UAB. I stayed there on staff for a year and we started acute pain service and we started doing uh, continuous uh, lumbar epidurals in a three day hospital stay. Uh, then we moved on in, 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 after many years of that, in the 2000s, we started doing femoral nerve blocks. Uh, then we went to femoral nerve catheters. Uh, adductor canal catheters came along in 2012 uh, to decrease that uh, femoral block and the quad uh, weakness you get with a femoral catheter and femoral blocks. And then we moved up a little more proximally up the leg just uh, two or three years ago with the femoral triangular excuse me, femoral triangle catheter. And we'll talk about that now. Um, that's the cornerstone of our multimodal post-op analgesia. Regional anesthesia, analgesia and continuous catheters, I think, are the, the cornerstone of really what you build everything else around. And how we do it, we start with an initial bolus of 20 uh, cc's of ropey 0.2%. Ropivacaine 0.2%. Um, we use uh, uh, that so that we don't, if we do get up close to the femoral nerve, we, we don't want to get quad weakness. And then we send them home with a pump. It's an electronic pump that runs bupivacaine 0.125%. And what our pump, the way we've uh, got our pumps running in the last couple of years, we use an intermittent bolus, uh, which gives an eight cc bolus every four hours. And we run this catheter for four days. Uh, the patients are allowed a demand bolus, which they can do every two hours. So if it gives them an a regular intermittent bolus, two hours later, they can give another demand bolus while they're waiting on their other intermittent bolus coming at four hours, and it's going to come automatically. So the pa patients still have um, a, basically a PCA uh, regional anesthesia technique where they can give themselves their own boluses if needed. They discontinue their own catheter. We leave them in four days. Uh, we were leaving catheters in three days. And I talked to our, a few years ago, we talked to our recovery room nurses and we asked them, said, you know, how are they doing on that fourth day when that catheter's out? And they said, you know, there's still a good bit of pain there. So we moved it up to four days. Some people think you should leave it in five days. Um, but I can tell you a three, four or five day uh, catheter is much better than a, a 18 to 24 hour single shot block when you're talking about an invasive surgery that's as painful as a total knee. And to send these patients home, we have to treat them for more than just a day. Um, and, and if we're going to be pain management specialists and be really involved. And your surgeons really appreciate that if you take that into consideration and you work hard to help them do a successful program. And like I said, the patients pull their own catheter, it's real easy. They just throw it away. They return their pumps in a self-address box that we give them, and that's pretty easy. So let's talk about adductor canal blocks and shift that into a femoral triangle block. So we start doing adductor canal blocks uh, after reading a letter to the editor by uh, Bansui a few years ago, and he showed where you have the sartorius in the mid-thigh and right in the middle of the sartorius is the artery and vein and the saphenous nerve sitting right next to the artery, next to the sartorius. This being uh, anterior lateral, this being posterior medial. And so when we're doing this, we're talking mid thigh. We're talking about halfway between the knee and the hip, the mid thigh. You can see uh, the sartorius here and our artery right in the middle of the sartorius. So that's, that's more or less where most people do an adductor canal block. And again, from the other side of the leg, you can see we're mid thigh uh, right there between the knee and the hip. So when you're in the mid thigh, you see the sartorius here and you see the artery and you see the saphenous nerve seven sitting up here next to the artery. The nerve to the vastus medialis is away from the saphenous at this point. Matter of fact, it's about to leave and go right into the vastus medialis muscle here. So if you're blocking here, you're not exactly getting the nerve to the vastus. If you're blocking here, you're not exactly getting the saphenous. For total knee, we really like to get both of these, these nerves. Um, the nerve to the vastus medialis goes down to the anterior capsule of the knee and the saphenous nerve comes down and gives branches to the medial side of the knee. Um, so I'm gonna show you some videos 
to, to explain this anatomy a little bit more. This is uh, so here we are. You can see the sartorius, the artery. Here's our saphenous nerve. Here's our nerve to the vastus medialis. And we're going distally now. We started mid thigh and we're sliding distally. And you're going to see this nerve to the vastus go right out into the muscle here, right there. So at this point, if you come down here, you're totally going to miss the nerve to the vastus medialis uh, if you come in and block the saphenous nerve at this point. Now let's go more proximally and let's look at our uh, nerves as we go up. Uh, at that time we were going with our probe, we were starting mid thigh here and going distally. Now we're gonna go more proximally and see what the nerves do. So here's your artery, your femoral artery. Here's your vein. Here's the saphenous nerve. Nerve to the vastus is out here. As we go proximally, the artery is gonna shift more posterior medial and the nerve to the vastus here is gonna come in closer to the saphenous nerve. And we're going more proximal and more proximal with our probe. And now I think you can see that you've got the artery way posterior medial behind the sartorius. So we're gonna come in from the anterior thigh and come in through the sartorius, put our needle in here where we have both the saphenous and the nerve to the vastus medialis here in close proximation to each other. And uh, we feel like we get a better block of both nerves that way. You also, we also always use a nerve stimulator so we can actually get the stimulation of the nerve to the vastus and know if we're close to that uh, nerve or not, we'll get the stimulation. Um, Okay, that's what we just showed. So we're getting up to the, to the femoral triangle. When we get up to the femoral triangle, you see the sartorius, uh, the artery, the vein, the saphenous nerve, and the nerve to the vastus here. That's your femoral triangle. Also, we're gonna show you uh, a little deeper view where you have the sartorius, the adductor longus, and the vastus medial, medialis. Deep to that's gonna be the finger, femur, sorry, not the finger, but the femur. And uh, here's your triangle, your femoral triangle, the sartorius, adductor longus, vastus medialis. Inside of that is going to be the uh, femoral artery and the saphenous nerve and nerve to the vastus medialis right here. Since uh, your ultrasounds don't come uh, labeled like that, we'll show it to you again. Again, this is a deeper look so to see the show you the femur, femur. Sorry about that. I just went too far. Here we go. Uh, to show you the femur the vastus medialis muscle, the Dr. Longus, and the sartorius. Now, if you go up even higher, I'm gonna show you where the saphenous and nerve to vastus actually come from. They come from the femoral nerve. And we go up a little higher, we can show you the femoral nerve here, next to the femoral artery. And as we're scanning distally from the femoral nerve, you're gonna see this femoral nerve break up usually into like three pieces. And that medial piece next to the artery is the nerve to the vastus and the saphenous nerve. And they're right here. And as you come on down the leg, now you can see the sartorius forming. You still have the femoral artery and we still have the saphenous nerve and the nerve to the vastus. They've actually split up now from that medial portion of the femoral nerve. And, and then you go on down the leg and they're gonna separate even further as we go. So we're up high here. Uh, in the femoral triangle. And so a lot of people are concerned about, you know, getting a femoral block. And that's why one of the reasons we start with 0.2 ropey for our initial block. And then we use 0.125 bupivacaine in our pumps, with very low concentrations to minimize the motor block. And of all the, these that I've done, I've only had one patient that really got quad weakness from their continuous catheter. Um, and that just happened uh, about a month, six weeks ago. And, uh, but with, with our concentrations and their uh, volumes, we haven't really had that problem. I know that's a concern a lot of people have. 
So back to show you, this is the uh, mid thigh or ductor canal block. You can see our marks here. That's where we're gonna do the femoral triangle block. So you can tell it's much more proximal. It's really pretty close almost to doing a femoral nerve block, but you're more distal. You're below the crease of the leg, whereas the femoral nerve block is between uh, the crease of the leg and the inguinal ligament. So we're up in here, that's a ductor canal. Here's a block look from the other side. Now this is our femoral triangle approach. And the other thing you can notice is we've got the probe a little bit of an oblique angle here. And that's cause we're gonna come in from this approach from lateral to medial. And we'll, when we start to thread our catheter, we're gonna have our, our bevel pointed uh, distally so we can thread the catheter down the canal parallel to the two nerves. And that way, if it pulls back a little bit, it's still next to the nerves and it's not gonna pull back and pull away from the nerves. Again, you see the uh, sartorius here and you see how the femoral artery is in the posterior aspect, posterior medial back down in here. Again, here's our approach. Uh, just giving you another look to give us a little bit of the oblique approach here we're gonna come in with. And sartorius, now the arteries flipped over on the other side and we're gonna come through the sartorius. And actually I wanna show you a video of that uh, right now. So, Here's our sartorius, here's our artery, here's our saphenous nerve, femoral, I mean, um, nerve to the vastus. Here comes our needle. We're getting a little muscle twitch, muscle stimulation. The key is you wanna pop through the fascial plane of the sartorius, and you wanna get your injection deep to the sartorius muscle down in here where the nerves are hanging out, down in this area. So you can see our needle is down here. We'll start injecting, and you'll see local spread in this area here. Very important that it's deep to that sartorius. Don't want to inject into the sartorius muscle. So you can see the spread of local all around here. It's kind of hard to see the nerves sometimes. They get pushed down, they get pushed around. When you're putting local in there, the nerves will move around. They're not going to stay still. So you have to sort of keep an eye on them. Sometimes it's hard to tell which what's nerve and what's not. Um, here's another uh, femoral triangle injection. So our needle's already in, we're through the sartorius, there's our femoral artery, and we're going to inject right here. And again, you see this expansion of local anesthetic. Now this will open up here, and it'll also track proximally and distally up and down the canal uh, where the nerves are running and get the local. Looks like we might have nerve up in, up in this area, but the local's still getting to it. So coming through the sartorius, always using a stimulating uh, needle uh, just to play it safe and so that you can find the nerve to the vastus and know exactly where it is. Sometimes it's hard to see. Now, when we thread our catheter in, um, no way, I went one too far. Here's our catheter. So here's our needle coming in. We've got the bevel pointed down the leg. So the catheter is gonna come out as you just saw there and then it's going to disappear because it's going to go distally down the leg uh, towards the knee uh, running alongside the nerves here in that canal. Now we're going to check we're going to be a little bit further down remember the artery was up here when we did our catheter insertion so we come a little further down the leg and the artery is going to move more closer to the middle of the sartorius almost like where we did the adductor canal injection before. And then we're gonna look for our, um, we're gonna inject through the catheter, look for local spread, you'll see it right here. Locals coming out and spreading here. So we know we're deep to the fascia of the sartorius, we're lateral to the artery, we're right here where the nerves are gonna be running, coursing down the leg next to the, to the femoral artery and deep to the sartorius. So our catheter is in good location here. Okay, so again, we wanna cover the saphenous nerve and the nerve to the vastus medialis. We wanna get the anterior capsule of the knee because it's innervated by the nerve to the vastus medialis. That's why it's important to block. The saphenous has an infrapatellar uh, branch that's uh, superficial and it goes inferior to the knee. 
So when they're doing a total knee and they, and they make their incision, their initial incision down the middle of the knee, they're going to cut this infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. So every total knee patient is going to have an area of numbness that's just inferior and lateral to the knee because they cut through that branch as they made their initial incision. Um, we like going up to the femoral triangle versus an adductor canal or a mid-thigh uh, femoral, we call them. Uh, because we feel like we get a little bit better coverage of the nerve to the vastus medialis. Also, when we were doing mid-thigh ductor canal blocks and catheters, uh, we had a few patients that had a saphenous neuropathy, uh, which consisted of numbness and pain, tingling, uh, burning from the knee to the ankle. And uh, we have found that moving up more proximally in the femoral triangle, that that has uh, basically gone away. We've hardly seen that maybe once uh, since we made that change. So if you've seen that with your adductor canal blocks, this is something that might be helpful to come a little more proximal and get in the femoral triangle uh, to avoid that saphenous neuropathy. Again, we always use a nerve stimulator. It just helps you. It helps you identify the um, nerve to the vastus medialis. Obviously, it won't help you identify the saphenous nerve because it's a uh, completely uh, sensory nerve and there's no motor function to the saphenous. Uh, be a little careful though, you can actually get uh, a twitch, um, a vastus medialis twitch when you're still in the sartorius. So be very careful and make sure you advance your needle through the sartorius and down into the canal where the nerves are. Uh, but th that can be a little bit confusing with, with uh, the nerve stimulator at times. Okay, so that's going to do our anterior medial aspect of pain with our femoral triangle. Now, what about posterior pain? So we all have iPhones and iPads and iPods and I this and that. Well, in regional anesthesia, we have our IPAC. So what is an IPAC? So an IPAC is an infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee. So it's very simple. And it was first described uh, by our friend, Dr. Sanjay Sina, who's up in Hartford, Connecticut. It was first described at the ASRA meeting in 2012. And what Dr. Sina uh, was utilizing this IPAC infiltration for, it was to block the terminal branches of the obturator and tibial nerves in the posterior aspect of the knee. Uh, the sparing, this, the, therefore sparing the main trunks of the, the tibial and common perineal nerves, maintaining a sensory motor function of the leg and foot, uh, therefore just almost completely alleviating the risk of foot drop. Um, actually, I think I did it. I got a foot drop one time with an IPAC because I got a little too aggressive uh, with my infiltration. Uh, I was cheating. I've learned if you stay down and do it the way Dr. Cena described and recommends, you really should not get a foot drop. And certainly in a total knee situation, uh, the surgeon is going to totally freak out if you get a, get a foot drop because he's always worried about the common perineal nerve, especially if they got a valgus knee and they're trying to straighten it up and they're worried about a stretch of the, of the common perineal nerve. So we don't want to, we don't want to confuse the issue and uh, cause them to have too many sleepless nights uh, with a situation like that. But what Dr. Cena described is we're basically infiltrating posteriorly to the femur so you can hear we're right in the knee, there's the patella, the femur, and posteriorly between the um, femoral nerve, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, tibial nerve, uh, popliteal artery and vein, between the artery and the capsule of the knee. So it's just an infiltration here to get those branches. Uh, Dr. Cena does an a, a medial or an anterior approach um, where he puts the probe right here and he sees the femur and the uh, femoral artery here comes down a little distally, oops, and uh, sees you get this image and then comes slides just a little pro, uh, medially. And this is the needle trajectory coming between the femur and the popliteal artery here in vein. So this wants to infiltrate in this way. So that looks like this. You got the knee kind of frog legged here and you got, it uses a curvilinear probe, as you can tell uh, on this one, uh, for, for his medial approach. And the needle's coming straight down uh, 
them from this approach um, and infiltrating between the femur and the popliteal artery. Uh, looking at it I from the work of Hickman. Okay, whoa. I'm going longer than I thought. I'll be done in just a second. Um, so we're coming in with a steep approach here. And you can see we're going to come in between the femur and the artery with the needle coming in this way. So real quick, we actually like the lateral approach where we put the knee up in um, like we're doing a popliteal block and we come in and, and, and look at it from uh, lateral to medial, just above the knee here. And I'm going to show you, we start with the femoral condyles and we're going to slide just proximally into where the femur flattens out. You can see the popliteal artery here. You can see we've moved up to the, just above the femoral condyles where the femur flattens out. You got the femoral artery and you got the, the tibial and perineal nerves up here. So we can come in and infiltrate along this area and that's our IPAC block. So show you real quick. Our needle coming in, let me see if I can advance here. We're going to inject, we use 20 cc's, a quarter percent bupivacaine and infiltrate all along through here. So let's see how inf infiltration starting. Come on. There it goes out here. Move along, we'll see some more infiltration, pull the needle back. We start on the medial side, infiltrate, pull back, infiltrate, pull back, infiltrate. And that's that's our lateral to medial approach uh, for the IPAC. Uh, so our friends over at Oshner that are getting hammered probably right now by the hurricane, uh, they did a study looking at IPAC on 106 patients. They compared uh, femoral nerve blocks, total knees with femoral nerve blocks versus femoral with IPAC versus adductor canal with IPAC. They showed that the IPAC really works because it reduced the opioid consumption in patients that had a femoral uh, versus the ones that had a femoral uh, with the IPAC block. Uh, IPAC with the adductor canals had as good analgesia as a femoral nerve, improved PT performance because they didn't have quad weakening and they had an earlier hospital discharge. So as far as the anesthetic, we'll get to the spinal, I'll try to get in. This is an orthopedic um, uh, article from the orthopedic literature, the Journal of American Academy of Orth Orthopedic Surgery this year, where they looked at 30 day outcomes of patients, looked at 80,000 spinal anesthetics and 103,000 generals. Bottom line was the general anesthetics were at a greater risk for any complication, major and minor complications, versus uh, spinal anesthetics. So the patients, uh, their conclusion was spinal anesthetics had fewer 30-day complications. And um, so our data is, has been in the last few years showing the spinals are better. 20, 10, 20 years ago, we used a lot of generals, but in the last 10 years, our data has shown spinal to be a little bit safer and, and better for our patients. Obviously we have the COVID impact of 2020. Most people are leaning towards doing a spinal anesthetic nowadays versus in general, just from that factor alone. What we do, uh, try to wrap up real quick. We use, uh, we do our, our spinals actually in the pre-op holding area. We use isobaric spinal drugs. We pre-op uh, IV bolus, give IV bolus to seven to 800 cc's. For our total knees, we use mepivacaine 45 milligrams isobaric. For our faster uni knees and total hips, we'll use isobaric chloroprocaine 50 to 60 milligrams. And uh, we use a 24 gauge sprot needle. When you've got a patient going home as an outpatient, uh, we certainly don't want a, the risk of spinal headaches. So our sprot needle, we certainly gonna decrease our risk uh, by using that approach. I'm not a fan of uh, spinal bupivacaine or heavy bupivacaine or isobaric. Isobaric bupivacaine just lasts way too long. And I think the spinal bu heavy bupivacaine increases your risk for cardiac and respiratory issues. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sprott here, um, uh, but a little over a year ago at the Ezra meeting in Spain, and that was that was quite enjoyable. So, sorry, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but uh, Scott, do you have any significant questions that would be uh, important? Also, I wanna let everybody know that the Payunk has a poster for lower limb regional anesthesia 
if you want to touch base with your rep or go to this um, email here, info at payampusa.com. And questions? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hickman. That was a, a very thorough and um, interesting talk, so we appreciate that. Uh, reminder, you can submit questions under the Q&A here. Uh, we'll try to get a, to some of them. There are a lot of really, really great questions and, and we'll probably run out of time here uh, before we get to them, all of them. Um, but a reminder that you will receive an email link where you can view uh, tonight's webinar on the Payunk YouTube channel. Uh, and we should be able to answer some of those questions that go unanswered tonight uh, in that forum as well. So uh, let's see, like I said, several good questions. Uh, as soon as you put up that slide regarding our preoperative cocktail, there are a lot of uh, questions that popped up regarding concerns for over sedation and any kind of lingering sedative effects in the recovery room. Have you observed that in your practice? You know, we, we really have not. And, and you got to go back to your patient criteria. These are healthy patients. They're not your elderly, um, weak uh, patients uh, the, the, that are frail. These are healthy, aggressive patients that are in great shape. And so we, since they're outpatients, we have not seen any issues uh, with that. And that's, that's a good question. I would, I would ask that same question. If I was in a hospital setting, then you'd be a little more concerned with that. Good question. Right. Uh, and you've obviously mentioned the benefits of, of putting catheters in. There's been several questions rego regarding alternatives to catheters. Uh, if your program, for example, doesn't have a, a catheter capabilities, uh, specifically related to Expiril, and have you had much experience using Expiril for these cases? You know, uh, not in the in the femoral triangle or adductor canal. I can't really speak to Expiril. I've tried it probably a couple of times, which is probably not enough experience to really give a good answer. I, I wasn't real pleased. We've been fortunate. We've been doing catheters here for 13 years and, and an outpatient uh, basis. And so uh, we've had such good success and, and we've had a strong program. We haven't really utilized Expirel that much. We do do it some on interscalings, but not in the lower extremity. Sorry, that's a good question though. Yeah, and then along those lines, uh, how do you manage a failed catheter in the middle of the night? If you do get that phone call at two o'clock in the morning, what, what are some steps you take to, to manage that patient? Uh, great question. Um, and that's one of the reasons we, we do thread that catheter down the canal parallel to the nerve so that if it does pull back, it stays next to the nerves. Um, that's a key factor on, on this block. And so that minimizes that. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do. You try to work that patient through the night. Um, you uh, tell them to take whatever PO medicine they may have, whether it be a nonsteroidal, a narcotic, a, a gabapentinoid. Um, you know, try to get them through the night, ice, and then and then we will we will have them come back if we know that catheter or we feel strongly that catheter is not in a correct position. We will have them meet us first thing in the morning when we get back to the surgery center and evaluate the catheter, bolus it, look at it under ultrasound. And if it's, uh, if it's uh, moved completely away from the nurse, we'll take it out and replace that catheter. Great. And, and, and it's a lot of people have that fear. And one of the things that limits a catheter program a lot of times, and I, I can just, I've said this over and over, if, if you really work through it and you have dedicated people uh, that is a rare, rare, rare scenario. A matter of fact, we keep data, and I think it's of our patients that actually have to come back to the surgery center. I think it's less than two percent of our patients that actually come back with catheter issues. Uh, I had a question regarding the IPAC. How do you control posterior pain after that IPAC wears off? Uh, great question, and, and that's where that uh, Robaxin comes in quite handily because um, it really seems to be a lot of spasm-mediated pain and hamstring spasm, uh, and we've just seen great results. And I know other groups from Orlando to um, Orange County that uh, are big on Robaxin too, and they agree that it really it, it helps in, in that factor because you're right, it is that's a limited time on the IPAC. There seems to be a lot of disbelief that we uh, rarely experience quad weakness doing the block that proximally. Uh, do you believe that that's a result of the concentration of the local anesthetic or the, the location of the block that prevents that weakness? Um, 
you know, I think it's probably a combination of both. It's a, it's a good question. And I understand uh, the, the concern and, 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 and the question. Uh, one thing I do when I inject, I, very often, I will t- after I'm done, I love to scan up and down the nerve to see the spread of the local. Um, I, and it's pretty much any block I do. I have done that for years. And on this one, you're, you are very proximal. And I will scan up and I'll actually see that local spread up to, to almost the femoral nerve, but it just doesn't ever seem to really get there. And if it does get there, the local just stays on that medial aspect of the femoral nerve where the saphness and the nerve devastus are. Uh, I think doing 0.2% ropey is huge. I think if you, if you used, um, you know, half percent bupivacaine, there, there might be a bigger problem there. Uh, I think that's a factor. I think if you're careful and, and, you, and some people use 10 to 15 cc's in this block uh, and you can cut your volume down if you're really that concerned about it. If you want to use a higher concentration of a local anesthetic, I would recommend using only 10 to 15 cc's instead of using 20. And I think that's, that's one thing, you know, we get away with it because we're using the 0.2 ropey. Perfect. Uh, a couple of quick ones here. What type of twitch do you see with the vastus minialis stimulation? Um, you get that medial twitch down the medial thigh, and you'll also, the VMO, which comes up and attaches to the patella, you can actually see a patella snap, uh, both a medial twitch down the thigh and the, the patella snap. You can see both those with the vastus minialis twitch. And I don't recall if we addressed this or not, but your block's done pre-op or post-op. Pre-op, we really do that pre-op. What, uh, what I like to do, I start with the IPAC, then do the adductor canal, I mean the femoral triangle catheter. And then um, if, we're, if we're ready, uh, we'll go ahead and do the spinal in the pre-op area. And if that patient's, we got a little time, say it's the second or third case, uh, we'll wait until we're pretty close and get our timing done and then do our spinal closer to when we're ready to go into the room. But we do, we, we try on all our uh, post-op analgesia blocks, try to get them in pre-op as, as most as we can. Uh, sometimes we have a time factor and we have to do them in post-op, but we like to do them pre-op. Great. Uh, I had a question. How long are your surgeons taking for your total joint surgeries on average? Um, <laughs> our total knees, um, you know, it depends on who you're asking. If you're asking them, it takes like 45 minutes, right? But the, we end up being in the OR closer to three hours uh, because um, they'll do the surgery and then they leave and they leave a PA to close. And sometimes it takes the PA longer to close than it took them to put the, put the, the, the implants in. But as a general rule, we're in the operating room with our total needs about two and a half hours most of the time probably. And that mepivacaine, I, I don't know if I mentioned that before, that mepivacaine dose of 45 milligrams, we consistently get about two and a half hours of anesthetic from that. And that seems to work pretty well for us. All right, I agree. Uh, let's see, here's one uh, mild source of contention between the two of us here. Do you tunnel your catheter? <laughs> so, so I've been doing catheters for a long, long time. We were putting epidural catheters in, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. And so back then we tunneled everything. Uh, now the only catheter I tunnel is my interscaling catheter. I do not, I do not tunnel femorals or femoral triangle catheters or popliteal or sciatic catheters. The only catheter is uh, that I tunnel still is an interscaling. And as mostly I tunnel it a little bit medially to get away from the surgical area, to get out of the surgeon's way, to get my dressing further away. So I'm not a tunneler like, like I used to be. Um, hopefully most of our surgeons uh, see the benefit in regional anesthesia, but uh, I'm, certain, I'm sure some people get pushback from the surgeons a little bit. Uh, maybe concerns about infection of an endoline catheter for a total joint. Do you have maybe some pointers for people uh, to, to get the buy-in from the surgeons and get them on board with regional? As far as continuous catheters go? Um, yeah, or, I, or regional in general. Regional in general. Uh, wow. Uh, that, that has been swinging, I think, the last 10 years. I think the orthopedic, especially the orthopedic training, 
uh, is these guys are being more exposed to, to regional anesthesia and blocks. I'm, I, I, I'm guessing the younger orthopods, uh, you're getting more resistance from your older orthopods. And um, to, to really, you know, just look at the orthopedic data uh, of spinal anesthetic versus general anesthetic. It's in their literature. Uh, and and the, it, they talk about blocks. They talk about femoral blocks at their meetings. It's a, it's a hot topic to convince, you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, if you've, you've got a guy that's kind of, you know, been, you know, doing orthopedics for 25 years, he's not going to change. My get my suggestion is work with the younger guys, and and really, if you're really just starting out a program and trying to do regional, get one guy on your side. Work with one surgeon, get him going, and he'll start talking about the benefits to the other orthopedic surgeons, and then you grow surgeon by surgeon by surgeon. So I would say the the my biggest recommendation, especially. If you're just trying to get it going and get some guys going, um, start with one and let it grow from there. Uh, if you've got somebody that's really, really difficult and set in their ways, I, I don't have any magical recommendations for that. I've just been fortunate to be around guys that have always appreciated what we've done. Yeah. And I would add to that, that uh, take ownership of those patients and, and their pain issues. So they do have any kind of failed catheter insist that they call you tonight. In fact, all our patients are, are provided with our personal cell phone numbers. Uh, that may sound scary to a lot of people out there, but we, we really don't get that many calls. But every, every catheter patient we send home has uh, complete access to us 24 seven. I think the surgeons certainly appreciate that and, and then deflecting some of those phone calls in the middle of the night. So uh, as, as well as complications, any block complications, uh, really try to own those and, and manage that patient. Don't, don't uh, pawn that off on the surgeon. I think that's been a big part of our success as well. Absolutely. A great point there, Scott. And, and one thing Scott and I have tried to do, we, we, if there's a problem with a catheter um, and the patient's at home, we want the surgeon to never even know there was an issue. We want to get that call, get them back in or whatever we need to do and manage that patient without them even know there was ever a patient uh, problem. And, uh, and as Scott said, I think if you're successful in that way, you'll get uh, more fans uh, from your surgical colleagues. Great. I think we have time for one more question. I'll turn it back over to the faculty here. But again, a lot of really, really good questions here. And we'll try to answer some of those uh, via the YouTube channel forum there. Uh, do you have any adjuncts in your spinals, such as epinephrine or uh, narcotics? You know, I do not. Um, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to use narcotics. I guess you could use a short acting narcotic, but with these patients going home, uh, we were not using narcotics and certainly would not use uh, Duramore for any long acting narcotic. Uh, that's one of the reasons we went. I like uh, isobaric local anesthetics. They last a little longer. You don't really need the adjuvants. You don't need epi. Um, and then we use a multimodal approach. So we have not used adjuvants and, and utilized the isobaric to, to, to work for our timing. And I know everybody's got different surgeons that are on different timelines and you have to work and figure out what's, what works best in your situation in your practice. So that's a good question. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have any power outages here. I'm curious to see what the weather is doing outside since Dr. Hick and I have been on lockdown in our offices here. Uh, but I'll turn it back over to our faculty here. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone. I wish I could see you. <laughs>